Alright, welcome to the Chapter 3 homework review. Um, let me get this full screen. Alright, there we go. Alright, so this week's homework assignment, um, I forgot to look at how you guys did, but uh, I think the scores were pretty good overall, from what I could tell. Um, the There's a few topics though, that we want to go over, and these are important ones for the exam this week as well, so you want to brush up on these if you had any trouble. Uh, so there's going to be a couple categories of problems. We'll see um, a few on Lewis structures and then a few on the properties of covalent bonds. Those seem to be the ones that, that gave us the most trouble on this assignment. And then if there's anything else, um, please come see me about any other questions that you have related to this assignment. All right, so let's get right into it. We're going to start with a few that were requests, um, and also they're all related to Lewis structures, so they're kind of all topically related as well. So this first one... As indicated by Lewis structures, which of the following would probably not exist as a stable molecule? Um, so we didn't really talk about this in class exactly, or, or in the, at least not in these exact words. Um, but in general, if you're talking about a, what we call a stable molecule, which is what this question is asking about, you want to have... Um, the octet rule should be obeyed, so you shouldn't have any violations of the octet rule except for the ones we talked about, which would be beryllium and boron having fewer than eight electrons, but you shouldn't have anything else that has fewer than eight electrons besides hydrogen. Um, these are all carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So for these compounds here that we're talking about, A through E, you should have complete octets for all the carbon and oxygen. And if you don't have that, that's probably the best sign that it's not a stable molecule. And generally speaking, you're going to have, in stable molecules, you're going to have all electrons are going to be paired. Now, this is not one that's 100% true, but in, in, a lot, in most stable molecules, you have an even number of electrons with all the electrons paired, either as bonds between the atoms or as lone pairs. So we'll look for these two things. The first one, A, is CH3OH. Um, now, there is a shortcut we, we should learn for drawing structures of what are called organic molecules. This will come up a little bit later on, um, on a future problem as well. But for, for now, what we want to do is we want to have, um, we want to know how many electrons there are, and then we want to just arrange them quickly. So for CH3OH, we have four electrons from carbon. We have four hydrogens, each with one electron each. And then we have an oxygen that's going to contribute six electrons. So these are the number of valence electrons that each of these structures contributes. Um, so that's the first thing we want to keep in mind. So this one should have 14 valence electrons for CH3OH. And when the formula is written in this way, with carbon first and then hydrogen oxygen, everything that comes after the carbon up to four things is going to be bonded to it. So carbon is never going to form more than four bonds because it can't expand its octet. So if we have CH3OH, that means our carbon is going to have three hydrogens bonded to it, then it's going to have the oxygen, and then the oxygen is going to have the last hydrogen, so that's why the, hyd the last hydrogen comes after oxygen. So that's kind of a shorthand way of writing this structure out. We need to fi figure out if there's any more electrons to put in, so we, we need 14. This has one, two, three, four, five bonds, which is a total of 10 electrons, so then to complete the octet of oxygen, we put the last four electrons there. So this structure is fine. Um, this is a common compound called methanol, in case you were wondering. But anyway, it has complete octet, has all paired electrons, so we're all good. If we go to B, which is CH2O, the number of electrons here, we have four for carbon, two hydrogens, each with one electron, and then an oxygen. So this one's only going to have 12 valence electrons, and so we want to see if we can draw a stable structure with 12. So CH2O is going to be carbon bonded to two hydrogens, and oxygen. And so if we complete the octet of oxygen, we've used all 12 of our electrons here, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Our carbon still has an incomplete octet, but what we can do to fix this and get rid of formal charges is change one of those lone pairs into a double bond. And so this is a stable structure for CH2O. Everything has an octet, all the electrons are paired. If we go to choice C, though, what we'll see here is we have four electrons for high, uh, carbon, three hydrogens just one, with one electron each, and then an oxygen. This guy only has 13 electrons, so that's sort of our first clue that something weird is going on. We have an odd number of electrons. There are stable molecules that have an odd number of electrons. This doesn't immediately tell us 
But if we try to draw a Lewis structure for this, what we end up with is... So we put the three hydrogens and the oxygen on carbon. And we can't form any double bonds because we already have four bonds to carbon, eight electrons. And then if we put the rest of the electrons in, there's 13 electrons, we've used eight of them, so we can only put five more on oxygen. And so what you'll notice in this structure is that the oxygen only has seven electrons surrounding it. It violates the octet rule. Okay, because this is one, two, two for the bond, and then three, four, five, six, seven. Seven electrons for oxygen, it wants to have eight. So this is likely not a stable structure. So this is the one we're going to pick. We can quickly draw Lewis structures for the last two. So C2H2 is going to look like this. And that's going to have complete octets, correct number of electrons. And then for C3H4, there's actually a few different ways you could draw this. This one's a little bit tricky, but if we put all the carbons in a row, and then we, we arrange the hydrogens in some way, we could do it like this is one way. There's a lot of different ways to draw this structure, but all of them are going to have complete octet. And you'll notice that C3H4 has 3 times 4 is 12 plus 4, 16 electrons. I counted that right. So it has even number of electrons, which usually means there's a way to arrange them correctly. And there's more than one way to do this one, is what we call isomers. So this one will be hard to draw an exact structure for, but I think it's very clear that this structure here, CH3O, which has an odd number of electrons, cannot have a complete octet on oxygen. There's no way to make that, so this is one that's likely not going to be stable. So whenever you're looking at a problem that asks you which one would not be stable based on the Lewis structure, you want to see is it possible to complete the octets, is it possible to um, you know, have all the electrons paired ideally, and those are going to be the things that you look for there. All right, the next question dealt with Lewis structures, where the Lewis structures were given to you, and it wants to know, this is the per iodate anion, IO4 minus, so we have per chlorate, which is ClO4 minus, this is per iodate, IO4 minus, same uh, naming convention, and it wants to know for which ones are the formal charges minimized. Um, all right, so then what we have to do for this is, is count formal charges. All of these have the correct number of electrons. We don't have to worry about that. We just have to look at formal charges and see which one has the minimum number and magnitude for the formal charges. So we look at this first structure here. Remember, the way that we calculate formal charges is we take the number of valence electrons that the atom has. So iodine is in group 7A. It's a, it's a halogen element, so it's going to ideally want to have seven valence electrons. We subtract the number of bonds that it has, so the iodine in this one has four bonds. And then we have um, the number of lone pair electrons, which in this case is zero. So in this structure here, with all single bonds, the iodine has a plus three formal charge, which is, as we said in class, you don't typically want to have formal charges that are greater than plus one or minus, or, or smaller than minus one. So you want to have, you know, plus ones and minus ones are okay, but if you have anything that's plus two, plus three, minus two, all that, that's not great. So this one's probably not going to be the answer just based on the formal charge in iodine. If we look at each of the oxygens, a pattern we should start to recognize, we've already seen it a lot in class two, is that if we have oxygen with a single bond, oxygen wants to have six valence electrons. Single bonded oxygen has one bond, and then we see that all of these oxygens have a total of six non-bonding electrons. So six minus one minus six is minus one. So each of the oxygen in is, is minus one here. And as we said, the sum of the formal charges should equal the total charge, which is negative one. So plus three and then four minus ones adds up to give minus one. So that, that all checks out. Um, but this has a plus three and four minus one. So minus one in oxygen is not bad, but having a plus three in iodine likely not going to be the answer. If you look at this one here, we have, in this case, the iodine is going to be seven, is the number of valence electrons. This time it has five bonds, still no lone pairs. So this is still a plus two formal charge on iodine. And if we look at the oxygens, there's two different types of oxygens. So again, we have a bunch that have single bonds. Those are all gonna be minus one. Same as we saw in the last one. We don't need to calculate that again. For the oxygen that's double bonded, again, a very typical arrangement for oxygen. Six valence electrons contributed by oxygen, two bonds in this case, and then four non-bonding. So whenever you have oxygen with a double bond and two lone pairs, which you often will see it have, this is going to be a zero formal charge. So this one's a little bit better, but it still has a plus two in iodine. 
we go to this alternative here, iodine now has one, two, three, four, five, six bonds. So now we're down to plus one for iodine. That's not bad. We have a couple of double bond oxygens that have zero formal charges. We have a couple of single bonds that have negative one. So this structure looks a lot better, but we still have a plus one next to a minus one. And as we said, if you have a plus one formal charge next to a minus one formal charge, <coughs> it is possible to cancel that by drawing another double bond. And so that's what we do down here. In this structure down here, we've made one more double bond between the iodine and oxygen. And so for the iodine, what we now have is seven valence electrons as an atom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bonds, no lone pair. So now our iodine has zero formal charge, and the only formal charge we have in this molecule is the one oxygen that has a single bond, which is still going to carry a minus one formal charge. Now this last one here, if we look at this one, iodine has eight bonds now, still no lone pairs. So in this one, the iodine carries the minus one formal charge, and all of the oxygens are going to be zero in this case. So from the standpoint of how many formal charges they have and what they are, these two structures look equivalent because you have, in this case, uh, a minus one formal charge on oxygen, no other formal charges. This one has a minus one formal charge on iodine, no other formal charges. This is very much related to something we talked about in class, which is if you have to have a negative formal charge, which we do here because this is an anionic complex, anionic species, if you want to have a negative one formal charge, it should be on the more electronegative atom, which is almost always going to be one of the atoms on the outside, the outer atoms. So this is going to be the preferred structure here. So I think these are all multiple choices. This would be choice D, I suppose. Um, but this is the correct structure because both of these last two minimize formal charges, but you want to have the negative formal charge on the more electronegative atom, which is what we do here. All right, so that's how we evaluate formal charges um, to, to determine which one is the best arrangement. So there's two choices where they're minimized, but this one has the, the better of those choices. All right, this next one here is also related to Lewis structures. Um, so we want to complete the Lewis structure for the molecule and then evaluate how many single and multiple bonds it has. So here's where we're going to want to use some shortcuts to help us. So first of all, we should recognize that if we write something as CH3, that means it's going to be carbon with three hydrogens bonded to it like that, all single bonds of course for hydrogen. The next carbon is labeled as CH, so it's going to have a hydrogen, and then we have a CH3 coming off of that, so that's going to be a carbon with three hydrogens. So it helps to expand out the structure because we do need to count the individual bonds. This one is then bonded to a carbon with an oxygen on it, and then we have a carbon and a nitrogen. So first thing we have to do is complete the Lewis structure. So for compounds like this, which we call organic compounds, they're mostly made up of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, we want to make sure that each atom has a complete octet, every non-hydrogen atom. And so there's some shortcuts we can follow for doing this that are, that are going to be helpful when we're looking at problems like this. So all of these atoms want to have complete octets, but the way they do that to minimize formal charges is going to be different. So for carbon, you're almost always going to have four bonds and zero lone pairs. So carbon forms four bonds, but typically doesn't have lone pairs. Nitrogen is going to be three bonds and one lone pair. So it will still complete an octet, but it will be in a slightly different way, where it will be three bonds and one lone pair. Oxygen is going to have two of each. That will complete this octet and have result in zero formal charge doesn't have to be a double bond, but it's going to be two total bonds, or same with nitrogen. It doesn't have to be a triple bond, but it needs to have three total bonds. And then finally, if we have a halogen, so I'll we'll abbreviate it as X, chlorine, bromine. If they're one of the outer atoms in these structures, not the central atom, but an outer atom, they're typically going to have one bond and three lone pairs. I guess fluorine is probably the better one to put here. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine. So if they're, if they're one of the outer atoms, and especially if they're one of these organic compounds that's mostly carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, we would put three, one bond and three lone pairs on those. And then, of course, not to leave it out, hydrogen is just going to have one bond and one bond only. That's true of any compound. Okay, so these are the shortcuts we want to follow. We want to make sure that all of our carbons have four bonds and no lone pairs. All of our nitrogens have three bonds, and then our oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs. So this first carbon here already has four bonds. 
one, two, three, four, three to hydrogen, one to the carbon next to it. This carbon has four bonds, one, two, three, four. This guy up here has one, two, three, four. So we don't add anything to there. Then if we get to this carbon here, we notice that as it's currently drawn with this sort of skeleton structure, it has only three bonds. This oxygen only has one bond. It wants to have two, as we said. So we're gonna draw a double bond there. That gives the carbon a complete octet. That also then satisfies oxygen once we add the two lone pairs to it. And then if we go, so this carbon is now happy with four bonds. This carbon here only has two bonds. We can't draw another bond to the carbon before it because that one already has its four bonds. But if we look at the nitrogen, this nitrogen now only has one bond and it wants to have three. So we can satisfy that by drawing two more bonds, a total of a triple bond there. Now this carbon has one, two, three, four bonds. Nitrogen has one, two, three bonds, and we add the lone pair to complete the octet. So this is sort of a shortcut method for drawing these kinds of things. You'll want to practice this a little bit to get the hang of it, but um, if you follow these rules that I've listed over here on the right side, that will work 99.9% .9 of the time, especially for compounds like this. All right, so then finally, all we have to do is count single bonds and multiple bonds. So for the single bonds, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So we have 11 single bonds. And then for multiple bonds, remember a multiple bond is anything that's not a single bond, so a double or a triple in this case. So we have a double bond here, a triple bond there, a total of two multiple bonds. And each one just counts as one multiple bond. So the correct answer for this would be 11 and two. Okay, and we'll see these kinds of structures also a little bit later in chapter four, which we'll cover this week, and how we can also draw them to and understand some things about the types of bonds. That's something that's coming a little bit later. All right, last Lewis structure question, I think. Uh, no, sorry, two more Lewis structure questions. In thionyl chloride, Cl2SO, S is the central atom, as we're told, the formal charge in sulfur and number of lone pairs are which are what numbers, assuming all the atoms obey the octet rule. Okay, so we wanna know how many, what's the formal charge in sulfur and the number of lone pairs. And also keep in mind this parenthesis here, all atoms obey the octet rule. That means we wanna make sure in this structure that every atom has exactly eight electrons. We don't wanna expand the octet for anything here. Okay, so Cl2SO, let's count the electrons. I'll go to the periodic table, just remind you how to do this if we forgotten. Okay, so where's your periodic table? All right, so we have two chlorines. So we find where chlorine is. Chlorine's in group 7A, so that means it contributes seven valence electrons. And then sulfur and oxygen are in the same column of the periodic table. And we go back to the periodic table and we see that sulfur and oxygen are right over here in group 6A. So each of those contributes six valence electrons, S2P4 for the respective valence shell. So we have one sulfur that's gonna contribute six electrons, one oxygen that will also contribute six valence electrons. And so we have a total of 12 plus 14 is 26 valence electrons, Cl2SO. All right, and then we wanna complete the octets of all the atoms. We put sulfur in the middle. We start with single bonds to all the outer atoms. And then it doesn't matter what order we write them in, obviously, as long as sulfur is in the middle. And then we complete the octets of the outer atoms. So each one gets a total of three lone pairs or six non-bonding electrons to complete the octet. We do that for both chlorines and the oxygen. And so by doing this, we've now completed the octet of three atoms. That's a total of 24 electrons, three times eight. And so we have two more that are gonna go on our central atom as a lone pair, okay? So, and then we look at formal charges now. And we also look at this structure and we see that sulfur now has exactly eight electrons as well. Six from the bonds and then another lone pair, so that's a total of eight. So we're, we've already obeyed the octet rule. We, we don't want to add any more multiple bonds anywhere. We could, um, this might not be the best arrangement of formal charges, but it does satisfy the octet rule, so we stop here. And if we look at this, the uh, formal charge for sulfur, we saw that it contributed six valence electrons. We subtract the number of bonds, which is three and then the number of non-bonding electrons, which is two. And so this one's gonna have a plus one formal charge on sulfur. So this structure here does have a plus one and a minus one, plus one on sulfur, minus one on oxygen, but we cannot draw a double bond without expanding the octet rule. We wanna have, the, we wanna evaluate the structure that has the octet rule obeyed, so we don't draw any double bonds as we said. 
So this one has a plus one FOMO charge on sulfur, and it's going to have number of lone pairs. So a pair of electrons is two, so it's going to have one lone pair. So the correct answer would be A for this one. All right, I think many of you picked choice E here. It does have two lone pair electrons, but it's only one pair. So you have to read the question closely to see what it's asking for. It's asking for pairs of electrons in this case. All right, then finally, the next one is a, about formal charge as well. And we're looking at the nitrite ion NO2 minus. All right, so for the for NO2 minus, we should draw the blue structure and then figure out the formal charge. So nitrogen is in group five. This is going to contribute five valence electrons. Oxygen, as we saw, is in group six, and now there's two of them, so that's going to be another 12. And then we have an overall negative charge here, so that's going to contribute one more electron to our total. This one's going to have 18 electrons. And then we uh, put the nit nitrogen in the center, it's the least electronegative. We start with single bonds to oxygen. All right, so that's a total of 16 electrons, and then we have two more that go on the central atom to use up our 18 electrons. In this structure here, nitrogen does not have a complete octet. It only has six electrons, two bonds and one lone pair. So we're going to need to draw one double bond to make an octet on nitrogen. So we take off one of the oxygen lone pairs and make it into a double bond. We could have done either oxygen. In reality, there's going to be resonance. But we can't draw any more double bonds. Regardless of what the formal charges are, we have to stop here because... Nitrogen is in the second period of the periodic table, second row, which means it cannot expand its octet. Nitrogen can only have up to eight electrons. So we stop here. This is our final structure along with the equivalent resonance form. But this one's asking for formal charge, so again, we have to evaluate formal charge on nitrogen. So nitrogen contributed five valence electrons. It has three bonds in this structure, and it has one lone pair which is a total of two extra uh, non-binding electrons, so this would have zero formal charge. As we said above in the uh, other example, nitrogen tends to have three bonds and one lone pair. That's exactly what it has here, so it has no formal charge. So the correct answer for this would be C. There is a minus one formal charge on one of the oxygens, but in, nit in this case, nitrogen has no formal charge. All right, the rest of these deal with properties of ions and bonds. So here we're looking for the largest radius. We have Br minus, Krypton, Rubidium plus, and Sr2 plus. So it's a combination of a neutral atom with ions. Now I think what many of you did in this problem was you attempted to use the periodic trends that we have. So we know from the periodic table that the radius decreases as you go from left to right. It increases as you go top to bottom. But that really only works if you're, if you're comparing neutral atoms. Uh, to each other. In this case, we have a combination of ions and atoms. So we first need to think about how many electrons they have, or what is the, the valence electron configuration. So we have Br minus, Krypton, Rubidium plus, and Strontium 2 plus. And so if we go to the periodic table, Br is here, so Br minus has the same number of electrons as Krypton, or has the same configuration as Krypton. And then we have Rubidium and Strontium plus. So Rubidium plus would also have 36 electrons, which gives it Rubidium plus would also have 36, meaning it has the Krypton configuration. Strontium 2 plus has two fewer electrons than, than this, so that's going to also give us the Krypton configuration. So this is what we call isoelectronic, uh, these are all isoelectronic ions because they have the same electron configuration. And so when ions have the same electron configuration, all we have to look at is the number of protons in the nucleus. So there's two ways of thinking about this. We're ranking what are called isoelectronic atoms or ions. Those are ones that have the exact same number of electrons. So all four of these choices have 36 electrons arranged in the same subshells. And so they are they're what we call isoelectronic. And then when we want to rank these, there's, as I said, two ways to think about this. The way I like to think about it is that in terms of increasing radius, the ones with positive charge are going to be smaller than the neutral, which are going to be smaller than the anions. And so the, the more positive charge it has, the smaller it is. The more negative charge it has, the larger it is. That's one way to think about it. Or you can think about it as number of protons in the nucleus. 
And if you have more protons in the nucleus, you pull the electrons closer to the nucleus. There's a stronger attraction between the nucleus and the electron, and so that's going to correlate with a smaller atom or ion. So for these species that all have the same number of electrons, if we're looking for the largest one, we want to find the one that has the fewest number of protons. So bromine is atomic number 35, so this would have 35 protons. Krypton is neutral, so it'll have 36. Rubidium has 37 protons. Chinon has 38 protons. So if we're looking for the largest one, we want one that, the one that has the least number of protons or the one that has the most negative charge, and that turns out to be Br- minus in this case. Okay, so periodic trends don't work so well unless we're just com unless we're comparing things that are all neutral. This has anions and cations included, so we have to first think about the number of electrons and which subshells they are in. All right, the next couple deal with properties of covalent bonds. So we're looking in this case for the covalent bond that has the highest percent ionic character. Now there were a couple on the homework that we didn't do very well on, which in my opinion were not the greatest comparisons to have to make about polar covalent bonds. So they were they were kind of difficult unless you had the electronegativity values, which you, you could have looked up. So I'm not going to go through those ones. I made sure the ones on the test are, are more straightforward. But this one is a straightforward one and it's still one that a lot of us miss. So we're looking for, in this case, highest percent ionic character. So we should recognize that this term, what this terminology means first. I didn't, I don't think I used it in class, but um, if you, if you're, if you're looking for highest percent ionic character, that's just a fancy way of saying most polar. So remember, ionic character refers to how polar the bond is. An ionic bond is extremely polar to the point where the negative and positive charges have been completely transferred. But a percent ionic character will tell you how polar a bond is. If it's higher, it's going to be more polar. Okay. So for these ones, they all have one atom in common. They all have carbon. And so what, for, what we're looking for in this case is the largest difference in electronegativity. We didn't give you electronegativity values here, but you can use the periodic table to help you. So carbon is the common species here. So we're looking for the one where the carbon is, has the greatest difference in electronegativity to whatever it's bonded to. Okay. Um, now the one that's not obvious from the periodic table is CH. So if you look at where hydrogen is, hydrogen is over here you know, at the very beginning of the periodic table. You would, you would think from the electronegativity trend that this might be, oh, this hydrogen is not very electronegative at all. But remember that hydrogen is sort of out of place. It's in a column with a bunch of metals because it has one valence electron, but in reality, hydrogen behaves as a nonmetal. So hydrogen is relatively electronegative. So what we should remember is that CH bonds are pretty nonpolar. Hydrogen is a little bit less electronegative than carbon, so there's a little bit of polarity there, but they're pretty close to nonpolar. The similarity, the carbon and hydrogen have pretty similar electronegativity values. So we'll eliminate that one. The other one we can eliminate is CC. This one is completely nonpolar. So if we're looking for highest percent ionic character, there needs to be a difference in electronegativity, carbon binding to itself. So we can eliminate these ones right off the bat. Now we have to compare CO and CCL. So carbon is less electronegative than both oxygen and chlorine. Another thing that's helpful to remember, we don't want you to memorize all of the um, all of the electronegativities, but if you're comparing carbon to things that are over here in group 7, it's a little bit hard because they're kind of far away from each other in the periodic table. What we should recognize is that carbon is less electronegative than all of the halogens except for iodine where it's about the same. So carbon is less electronegative than fluorine, is less electronegative than chlorine, bromine, iodine. So in this case here, carbon is less electronegative than chlorine, so we're going to have a polarized bond towards chlorine. But then if we compare that to oxygen, if we go back to the periodic table, oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine. Oxygen is the second most electronegative atom on the periodic table, so that means the difference in electronegativity between carbon and oxygen is greater than carbon and chlorine. That, that comparison may not be the most obvious, but carbon and oxygen is going to be more polar. Oxygen is the second most electronegative atom. So we can eliminate carbon chlorine because we know that carbon oxygen is more polar. And then finally, if we compare carbon oxygen to carbon fluorine, this one is pretty simple. Be or sorry, this is carbon nitrogen, not fluorine. This one's relatively simple because, again, carbon is less electronegative than both of these. Carbon is to the left of both of these. But it's going to be a greater difference with oxygen. So the difference between carbon and oxygen in electronegativity is greater than the difference between carbon and nitrogen. So carbon oxygen will be more electronegative also than carbon nitrogen, 
and so that's going to be the one that we end up picking as the most polar bond. Okay, so these electronegativity comparisons are sometimes a little bit tricky, um, but it's helpful to remember that um, fluorine is the most electronegative, oxygen is the second most, um, and that the halogens are all more more electronegative than carbon, except for iron. All right, this one I think is a little bit more straightforward, where we have three molecules, BF3, NF3, CF3, and we want to know which one is in order of decreasing ionic character of their bonds. So that means we want to go from most polar to least polar. Now, we just said in the last one that fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. So the first thing we should recognize is that for all of these bonds... partial negative charge should be on fluorine, which means the partial positive is on the other atom. So fluorine is more electronegative than everything, so it's always going to have the delta minus in any bond that it makes. Um, and so if you look at the answer choices here, choice D is already wrong because it puts the partial positive charge on fluorine in each case. So we can eliminate this guy here just on the basis of that. But all the rest of them at least have, I'm sorry, this one's wrong too, I believe, it has partial positive charges on fluorine. So those two we can eliminate right off the bat because um, the partial positive charge isn't even in the right place. Now if we want to rank the polarity of the bonds, BF, NF, and CF, we can do it two at a time again. So boron fluorine versus nitrogen fluorine bonds. Again, fluorine is more electronegative, so we're looking for the one that has the greater difference in electronegativity. So boron is less electronegative than nitrogen. Boron is to the left of nitrogen. So boron and fluorine are going to have a larger difference in electronegativity than nitrogen and fluorine. Okay. Okay, so boron fluorine should be smaller than nitrogen fluorine. And then if we compare nitrogen fluorine bond to a carbon fluorine bond, this is again, this is ranking their polarity. So this has a larger, sorry I did that wrong, this is more polar. So this has more electronegativity, larger electronegativity difference than nitrogen and fluorine, so that's more polar. And then finally, if you look at the other comparison, NF versus CF, nitrogen and carbon are right next to each other, so it's similar comparison as before. Carbon is less electronegative than nitrogen, so the difference between carbon and fluorine is going to be greater than the difference between nitrogen and fluorine. The way to think about this is you're looking for the atoms that are furthest apart on the periodic table from lower left to top right in terms of if you're looking for the most polar bond. So all of these are in the same row, B, C, N, and F are in the same row. So the ones that are furthest apart, boron and fluorine, have the greatest polarity. The ones that are closer, nitrogen and fluorine have the less polarity. Carbon and fluorine would be in the middle. Okay? So carbon and fluorine is going to be more polar than nitrogen and fluorine. And so then the final ranking is that boron fluorine is the most polar then carbon fluorine bonds in the middle, and then nitrogen fluorine. That's sort of how far apart they are within that row of the periodic table. So the answer choice that works out then is choice B, which has them in the correct order and also has the partial negative, partial positive charges written correctly as well. All right, and then last question, I believe. Here we go. So this one we're looking for trends in bond energy discussed in class. Select the strongest bond in the following group. So when we're looking at trends in bond energy, all we really need to think about is how, how long the bond is. So strongest bond is going to be the one that's the shortest bond. If we're looking for the weakest bond, that's going to be the longest bond. Now we said there's also the, the weakest bond equal to the longest bond. So there's this inverse relationship between bond length and bond strength, or bond energy as we sometimes call it. So there's that relationship. That's going to be what's important here. Now the other thing we also have to realize is that if you had a higher bond order, that also correlates with the stronger bond or the, the larger bond strength. Um, bond order is actually way more important even than bond length. So if you have a, if you have a double or triple bond, you expect that to be much, much stronger than a single bond. But that doesn't play in here. These are all single bonds that we're comparison. So all we have to look for is which of these bonds. We're looking for the strongest bond. We want to find the one that's shortest. 
And remember that the bond length is just equal to the sum of the atomic radii. So if two small atoms are bonded together, that gives you a shorter bond. If two large atoms are bonded together, that gives you a, a longer bond. In this case, we again have one atom in common among all of these. So carbon is in common. It's, it, all these bonds include carbon. So the one that's going to be the shortest bond, or this, which is what we want for the strongest bond, is going to want, be the one that has the smallest atom bonded to carbon. Okay? So carbon has a fixed atomic radius, uh, and then if we want to have the shortest bond, it needs to be bonded to something else that has a smaller radius as well. So we're comparing sulfur, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and fluorine and figuring out which one has the smallest radius, which is going to give us the shortest bond. So the periodic trend for radius is that it decreases as we go left to right, and it increases as we go top to bottom. Um, so I have to remember which ones we're comparing again. So sorry, we have oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, fluorine, and sulfur. Okay, so the ones that we're comparing are going to be these four here with sulfur. Now, sulfur is below all of the rest in the periodic table. It's in the third row instead of the second row. So this one's going to be the, lar the largest of the bond. The, the, sorry, the largest atomic radius, which will give us the longest bond. So anytime you go down a row in the periodic table, the atomic radii are going to be larger. Um, so this one's going to have the longest bond with carbon, so we can eliminate that one. But then between the rest of these, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, atomic radius decreases as we go left to right. So the smallest of those atoms is fluorine, which means that the carbon-fluorine bond is going to be... So the smallest of the atoms that carbon is bonded to is going to be fluorine, which means the carbon-fluorine bond is going to be the shortest, which means is also the strongest of the bonds. Okay, so whenever we're looking for the strongest bond, just look for the shortest bond length, which means that the two atoms that are bonded to each other are the smallest. All of them include carbon, so carbon paired with fluorine gives us the shortest bond because fluorine is a smaller atomic radius than all of the rest. All right, that takes us to the end of this homework review. A little bit longer this time because there are a lot of important and somewhat difficult concepts involved in this chapter, um, but I think uh, that covers a lot of things we had trouble with on the homework. Um, and so I wish you the best on the exam this week, and please come see me if you have any questions as you finalize your preparations for the exam. All right, I'll see you later, later today in class.